Welcome to part two of MTC's four-part series on smart parking, minimum parking requirements. Where do parking requirements come from? Most cities use a variety of publications in order to establish their minimum parking requirements, including the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Manual. This manual has collected data from automobile-dependent exurban locations around the country, mainly from Florida in the 1970s, and they establish average maximum observed rates of parking demand, which are then translated into minimum parking requirements for your community. These requirements came in uh, to place starting in the 1950s, um, when a rapid increase in automobile ownership in the United States created a significant problem of spillover parking. That is, uh, uh, motorists going to one home or one business that were parking in front of somebody else's home or somebody else's business. In order to solve this problem of spillover parking on the on-street parking spaces, um, cities started adopting minimum parking requirements that required all of the potential parking demand for individual uses to be accommodated off street. Now this seems like a good idea to make sure that there's no spillover parking on street or onto neighbors' properties, but it resulted in some unintended negative consequences. For example, if you require 2.2 parking spaces per unit at a transit-oriented development project, that parking area takes up about a quarter of the development site. That's expensive, and it means a lot fewer residential units. This is particularly problematic given the fact that we know, based upon the data, that people living at transit-oriented development projects here in the Bay Area have a lot lower parking demand than people living in more automobile-dependent spaces. And so if we designed our transit-oriented development sites based upon actual demand rather than one-size-fits-all demand, um, the result would be less parking, better building developments, more housing, and more opportunities for community benefits. Excessive minimum parking requirements also have a very large impact on the landscape. In this example, in another Bay Area location, you can see that when minimum parking requirements are required for each individual land use, the amount of area set aside for parking significantly exceeds the building area itself, even for buildings like retail and office that could readily share parking because their peak parking demand occurs at different times of day. As this pattern continues, you can see how um, our agricultural landscapes in the Bay Area are quickly turned over to fields of asphalt. When we look at more detail, we also see that the amount of space that a parking space takes up exceeds the amount of space that most of us work in. More importantly, when you start including the drive aisle space in a parking lot, the total amount set aside per car exceeds that of a typical studio apartment. Moreover, the sort of parking requirements that may work in one place in your community may not work in another place in your community. Similarly, at the fine scale, for uh, building locations on small lots or in challenging locations, it simply may not be physically possible to accommodate the right number of parking spaces on site. And so, um, for a sensible parking scenario, we need to be more flexible and to allow for um, important tools like sharing. It's also important to ask the question whether we in fact need minimum parking requirements at all. What would happen if we were to get rid of them? Would the world end? Would people have to drive around uh, in circles endlessly to try to find a parking space? Would developers build no parking? Um, in fact, when we look at communities around the world, or even here in the Bay Area, that have significantly reduced or eliminated their minimum parking requirements, instead what we find is that developers build the right number of parking spaces and invest the savings in creating more livable, more walkable, more desirable communities. And in fact, there are many examples here in the Bay Area, including places like downtown Petaluma and downtown Napa that have significantly reduced their parking in order to achieve uh, their larger community economic development and quality of life goals. It's also important to realize that if we simply plan for the average parking demand, we're only serving that 40 to 60% of our community that actually wants that amount of parking. We're completely ignoring the fact that there are a significant number of households that want fewer cars, and in some cases, no car at all. So providing a more flexible approach to parking allows us to accommodate both households with fewer cars as well as households with more cars 
than the average. A smarter approach to parking is also a critical component of any balanced multimodal transportation system um, that wants to focus on walkability, on transit accessibility, on reduced traffic congestion, improved quality of life, um, reduced carbon dioxide emissions, and improved air quality. So we urge you to think about the role of minimum parking requirements in meeting your community's larger goals and rethink them in order to make sure that they're in alignment with your largest goals.